We have now reached a point in our consideration which makes it quite impossible for us to take time for review. And it is necessary for us to go right on. Sufficient to say that we have been and still are occupied with the eight aspects of redemption. We have dealt with six of those. So now, the church. And we approach this matter as we have every other with the question, why the church? The greatest object of God in this universe is His Son. The second greatest object with God in this universe is the church. Those two are put together. Here is the statement of scripture. Gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Church, the fullness of Christ. If the church needs Christ, Christ needs the church. And we begin by asking what is the church? And in a few concise phrases, we answer that question. Firstly, the church is a particular body of people chosen in Christ before the world was. That is precisely stated in Ephesians 1, verse 4. There it is stated Christ was chosen, and that the church or this particular body of people was chosen in him, just as definitely as Christ was chosen and appointed, so was the church. Secondly, the church is a body of people called out of the nation to be a heavenly people now, not hereafter in ages to come, but now. That is definitely stated in Acts 15 verse 40. And it is that to which our Lord referred when he said, I will build my church. Thirdly, the church is a body of people who are not just so many individuals, and although, but although called individually, they were never chosen individually. <laughs> never chosen separately, but as a whole. Very important to remember that. The work of the Holy Spirit is always to make real that which has been eternally determined and appointed by God. A 
and through the work of the Holy Spirit, not being an afterthought, but according to plan, is to make real and to make working, operative, this eternal oneness in and with Christ, which is the purpose of God. Now I'm going to do something that I do not often do, but whenever I have done it, it has got me into trouble. <laughs> I'm going to read a paragraph from a book. The trouble is this, that if ever I have done that, afterwards everybody has wanted the book. Or to know what it is in order to get a copy, and I have found myself involved in all that the book contains. Whereas I have only quoted from it. That's just a hint to you. Please don't rush at me to know what the book is. But here is something from a book published several years ago, which is put in a very much better way than ever I could put it. And I give it to you because it is not mine. Here it is. It is essential to the right consideration of this subject, that is the church, that the magnificence of the New Testament concept of the church be apprehended. In the epistles to the Ephesians and to the Colossians, the view of the church which is Christ's body is set forth. It is there seen as the ideal, invisible, indivisible, inviolable company of the redeemed of the present age. None but the truly regenerate has part therein. None save the elect partake of its blessedness. Failure and defection are unknown to it. Into it the pretender and the hypocrite, hypocrite cannot come. Breach or division it cannot know. Its unity is unbreakable. Its calling and glory heavenly. Its relationship to Christ holy and intimate and its destiny bound up in him in splendor inconceivable. Through the centuries of our era, each marking generation that brings a contribution to it. While historically its members are being called one by one and incorporated into it, in its completeness and glory, it is ever before the eye of God. Indeed, it has been in his heart from before all time. From their heavenly vantage point, the angelic orders observe it and are impressed and enlightened concerning the manifold wisdom of its divine architect. Through the swift ebbing years of this age, Christ himself is its builder, adding stone to stone to this temple exceeding magnifico, himself the while abiding that day and at last complete, sanctified, beautiful, spotless, and radiant with heavenly glory, it shall be presented to himself and taken into the full enjoyment of an eternal association of blessedness, the features of which are at present undisclosed. I'm 
I'm going to quote something else from that book in a minute. But I am quite sure that you agree. The best on the one side is no exaggeration. On the other side, it does present us with something of tremendous account to God, to Christ, and to ourselves. You may have found some difficulty with some of those statements, but you must remember that the whole statement is made from heaven and God's standpoint, and not from ours. That is how he sees it, eternally. What he may be seeing, the condition of things as present down here may be another matter. But that is God's eternal conception, and that is how God will eternally have it. It will be like that. And eventually, it will prove to have been like that. It is good to see. But nevertheless, if we could see, from God's standpoint, we should see that every sentence of that statement is true. Let us suspend our difficulties for a little while and go on. The church is a definite object or entity. It is not just an abstract idea. It is not an imaginary thing. It is a reality in the mind of God and in its actual existence when it is seen according to its true constitution and not man's constitution. The church is of immense value and importance to God and to Christ. As we have read, it is declared to be His fullness. All the greater value of Christ, His fullness, are for the church, in the church, and through the church. We have the statement of God's word about it. We have the history of the church to bear it out. I mean, as to its continuance, its persistence, its very survival. And if we needed more evidence, of its importance and its value. We can always get it from one quarter which gives very irreligious solicitude for God's interest. Satan hates the church as he hates Christ. There has been more trouble over the church than over anything else. It is the cause of all the trouble. That is saying a lot. Come back to the book. And I'm very glad that I'm not saying this firsthand. Listen, all through the Christian age, a minority of believers has endeavored to carry out in corporate life these scriptural principles. The bitterest and most implacable opposition has come to them, not from the world, but from organized Christendom 
that is the system that men call the church by this powerful organization they have been in turn oppressed misrepresented persecuted reviled ridiculed and ignored but their persistence from century to century has supplied the proof of the practicability of these principles and of such a church being in the will of God. I have another book. This is about the church against such a transcendent truth affecting as it does the glory of God and the person of Christ. It is not a matter of surprise that the arch adversary should set himself with his utmost might and his most persistent and ingenious devices both by opposition and by imitation. And a lot more like that. It's enough. That came out of the statement that if there is one thing more than the Lord Jesus himself that Satan hates, it is the church and any true representation of it. Now I should like very much to spend some time speaking about the representation of the church. The necessity of it, the possibility of it, the nature of it. But you will see, I'm sure, before we get much further, that we've got to exclude a great deal. We may come back to a closing word on that later, but we are asking why the church? And I think the best way of answering that question is found in considering the various names or titles given to it in the Word of God. There are a number of such titles as you know. I think I would be right in saying that there are nine main titles for the church. Maybe others subsidiary, but in the main there are nine. Each one needs a meeting to accept. But if we were to really consider these titles which are given to the church, we should be getting very near to an answer to this question. Why the church? Let us run through them with a bare comment or two upon each. The first title given to the church is the house of God. But there it is necessary for us again to understand our terms or our words. When we speak of a house, we immediately think of a structure, a building. We pass along the street and we look at buildings and we say, that is a nice house or an ugly house or an unusual house. That is how we use the word. It is necessary for us to understand that that is not 
the full meaning of the word as it is used in connection with the house of God. We should be nearer the truth if we change the word into the household. Because that is the word. It is inclusive of the three ideas. One, the structure. God's building. Two, the content of the house. That is in the very word. That is you. The content of the house, what is in it? And three, the arrangement of the house. How the contents are deployed, arranged, set out, their place, their position, and so on. And then there is a fourth idea in the word. It is the government of the house. The structure, the content, the arrangement, the order, and the government of the house. That's all in this one word, house of God. Now you can see how much time could be positively spent upon that. The house of God. First of all, it is God's structure. I will build my church. It is God. Man does not make this. And it is impertinent to take hold of it and make it man. The proprietorship of this building is solely vested in God himself. What is in this house is there because God has put it there. And nothing, no one can come and have a place in the house of God except God puts him or her there. You can't join the house of God as your own choice, willy-nilly. You may talk about joining the church, but that belongs to another realm of things altogether. In the New Testament, the Lord added to the church them that were being saved. The Lord added. In this, only those whom the Lord includes are in the house of God. The order in the house of God is God's order. God has an order for his house. And he is very particular about his order. If we should ignore that, overlook that, set that aside, it is to our own loss, our own detriment. We shall find that in our lives there will be frustration, limitation. God will not be setting his seal upon us. God has an order. The Holy Spirit is the custodian of that order. And to be under the government of the Holy Spirit means to come into a divine order. God is a God of order. Satan is the God of anarchy and lawlessness. God is very particular about his order. You read the first letter to the Corinthians and see. Our placing in the house of God is the prerogative of God by the Holy Spirit. Place that we occupy, the function that we perform is God appointed and must be so. If we try to do what God has never called us to do, we shall be a misfit in the house of God. Now, under the Holy Spirit government, if we are content with that for which the Lord has brought us into his house, content with that, we'll be at rest. It will be ease and not fiction. God 
superintends his own heart. It is his government of his heart because it is his heart. And I repeat in this other connection that it is nothing less or other than impertinent to come into God's house and accept the order or try to impose our order. We must ever seek the order of the Holy Spirit and to be subject to him in the house of God. So much for number one out of nine. Second, the tabernacle and temple of God. They are identical in purpose. The difference only relates to certain conditions. If we will not stay to explain, leave such details aside in our hastening on, but identical in purpose, tabernacle and temple of God. There are two ideas in the main connected with this designation. Firstly, the place where God is. The place where God chooses to be. And you know, dear friends, there is a place where God chooses to be. And where he can be found. And normally, normally, that is in his heart, in his temple, in his tabernacle in the church. The church is supposed to be, intended to be, the place where you find God, where God is. That's not a building. That's the people of God. But you should find Him there. He chooses a place for Himself. How much there is. And the Old Testament illustrated us this. And his own son's words are, wheresoever two or three are gathered into my name, there I am. It's not the enunciation of an eternal principle that God chooses to be in a place. And there you find him. He chooses to locate himself. To locate himself. Oh, how one is tempted to enlarge upon that. But, believe me, if you, as a believer, as a Christian, detach yourself from the Lord's people and go off on your own independent way, you will be before long like Thomas, where the Lord is not. And like Thomas, you will not find the Lord until you come back with the other disciples. There's a lot more to that. But that is, God has chosen His temple, His spiritual temple now, as a place where He will meet us, where He can be found. And it is a place where He speaks. So it should be. So when it is according to his mind, it is. It is the place where he speaks. And I venture to go this further step and say that the nearer the thing corresponds to God's idea of the church, the more fully will you hear him speak. It is there that you will hear more from the Lord from the Lord, then you will if you are where the thing does not, either so much or at all approximate to his conception of the temple. Secondly, it is where God is worshipped. The one idea always associated with the tabernacle and the temple and that is holiness unto the Lord. The place of worship. Should I change this? Seeing that the temple is now 
not just the structure, but a people. It is a worshipping people. That is the temple, a worshipping people. And what is worship? You often define worship as the drawing of everything God wants. Everything unto the Lord. That is holiness or wholeness unto the Lord. Everything to Him. So should the church be. That is God's mind for the church. On to number three, Peter will tell us in his first letter, chapter 2, verse 9, that the church is a chosen nation. We have a lot of light thrown upon this in the Old Testament, as you know. But there are three things here connected with this conception of the church as a nation. That is, a people, as we said at the beginning, taken out of the nation for his name to be made here and now a heavenly nation of a different order. The very word heavenly, of course, carries that with it. A heavenly nation out from the nations and get in the midst of the nations. There are three things connected with that. Firstly, there is the principle or law of separation. That clearly is illustrated and enforced in the case of Israel as the earthly type of this church. <coughs> Separate from the nation. Israel lost its very integration, its vocation, its power, its glory, and everything when it lost that distinctiveness from the other nations and allowed a bridge to be built between it and the other nations worshipping their God. That was why Israel went into captivity, just that. The lost distinctiveness as a nation. And the Old Testament is a very forceful illustration. A very powerful object lesson of spiritual principle. But if that is true in a temporal way, an earthly way, how much more true is it and must it be in the spiritual and the heavenly and the eternal distinct? One thing has accounted for more love of glory, power, influence and the presence of God than perhaps anything else in the case of the church during the centuries has been the world getting into it and it getting into the world. The lost distinctiveness, separation. The nation was a constituted as well as a separated people. It was separated, and my word was it not separated from Egypt. Pharaoh tried to parley on that matter, just that they should leave a little behind, a little attachment. No, the Lord said through Moses, not a hoop of a single land shall remain in Egypt. And look at the, the breach that God made and the gap that he put between Israel and Egypt. It's all very illustrative. But then when he got them out, he constituted them. A nation. They came out, a multitude, we might almost say a rabble. But then God took them in hand to form and constitute them into an entity with spiritual laws and principles governing every detail of their lives, 
were right under heaven where nothing of this world could meet the need. Resources all from above, a constituted people on heavenly principles and a heavenly government. That is the church. And thirdly, as Peter tells us in this comprehensive statement, to show forth the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. The vocation of the nation is to show forth the excellencies of him. The vocation of the nation is to show forth the excellencies of him. In other words, to show how God excels. How God excels. All excellence he transcends. That was his life holy vocation. But if that was true in an earthly, limited way, how much more true that is in the heavenly, universal way of the church. To show forth his excellence. How he excels. How he excels. What he's trying to do all the time. We have said repeatedly he allows the enemy to have a good deal of terror and leash and go a long way and then he just shows how much further he can go. He allows the enemy to do much and then he just shows how he can take hold of the much and turn it to his own glory. The excellences of him shown in the church and by the church. Something to dwell upon, I think, friends. Look at the book of the Acts just from that standpoint alone and see the working out of what Paul meant and said. I would have you know, brethren, the things which have befallen me have fallen out for the furtherance of the gospel. And think of the things which befell him. All falling out for the furtherance of the gospel. One way in which his excellencies are shown forth. You can't dwell upon that, but his angels are looking on. I'm quite sure they are covering their faces and covering their feet and worshiping as they see the grace of God in many a suffering servant and child of God, showing the excellencies of his grace. As it's a large thing, there it is. We pass on to the next and the fourth, and we come to this English translation of the word, the church. The church. There it is, the word ecclesia, very rich and very full word, appropriated by Christ and the apostles to apply to this elect, this eternally elect body, the church. May I say that the modern equivalent of that is the assembly, because that word carries all the elements in it of the meaning of this word ecclesia. I hesitate to say with the word to break it up and explain it, because there the old stages are going to look right, they know all about it. But just this, in the Greek world, certain people were elected to a position upon the municipal council or government, either in a city or in a province or in a country. And at the given time when a session was to be invoked and there was business of the state to be attended to, the messengers went out to call together the men come and assemble together in order to transact the business of the state. 
And that body of men was called the Ecclesia. You see, it wasn't a church matter, an ecclesiastical matter as we think of it then. It was simply a, a state, municipal or political matter, the church. And there were these ideas. An elect company brought together to transact the business of the kingdom. And that word was taken over by Christ and the apostles and applied to the church. How did it is? An elect company called together for the purpose of carrying on the work of the kingdom. That's the church. An elect company chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Called. Called into the fellowship of his son. Called according to his eternal purpose. Called together. And with him. Entrusted with the affairs of his government. I wish the church we as the church approximated to that more closely and more fully. We must leave it. It's rich, full, father. Number five, the church which is his body. His body. We've read it from Ephesians 1, 23. And as you know, there are a number of other references to the church under that designation or title. Here we must sum it up in one or two concise statements. What is the idea and function of a body? Remember that it is the physical body that is the simile being used here. First of all, the body of a man is the vehicle of the expression of his personality. Not always can you read the personality through the features and the body, but, but usually a person gives themselves away by their body. Even if, as in some cases, you find it difficult to read what's going on inside, the very fact that it's difficult to read really tells you that they are not intending you to know, and you've read them. <laughs> we can't easily get away from this matter. The by gesture, by look, by many, many expressions, we betray ourselves to our bodies. That, at any rate, is the idea in having a body, the expression of the man he finds. He's finding his way to express himself. Well, that's quite simple, but it's the first idea of a body, you see. The church, which is his body, is the vessel, the embodiment of the Lord, the Spirit, in which and by which he is to express himself. If the church accorded with the divine idea as we met it and moved amongst it, we should know what the Lord is like. But let us take this to heart. Our very existence of the church is in order that people might know what Christ is like. Oh, the Lord help us. We fail him so much in this. So difficult to detect the real character of the Lord Jesus in his people. But that is the very first meaning of the body of Christ. But the body, here we are on so familiar ground, is an organic hole. It's an organic hole. It's not something put together from the outside is something which finds its oneness by reason of a life within. Related in every part 
interrelating, dependent and interdependent, how familiar the words are. That is describing the physical body. Every remotest part affected by what happens in any other part. Oh, we could enlarge upon that and deal with it in its minutiae, but we have to learn a lot more yet in actual spiritual apprehension and application of this reality about the body of Christ, the church is a body of Christ. We brought into that great sympathetic system of the body. A sympathetic system of the body that demands a real work of grace in us. The many ways in which that is put, we are to remember those who are in suffering as suffering with them, those who are in prison as in prison with them. That is, we are to get into their situation. Get into their situation. By the Spirit. It's an organic whole. One member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And probably, dear friends, uh, we are suffering a good deal for what we do not know. The suffering going on, and we are involved. And the Lord is seeking in our conflict to involve us in the needs of others. See, it is not just our apprehending of the truth. And it is not that we are alive and to it and understand it all, but it's God's fact that it is so. That it is so. Believers in other places are dependent upon believers in another place. They are affected. This is such a whole. We must leave it there. It is one sympathetic nerve system or running through the whole body. And if you and I really do become spiritually alive, spiritually alive, the expression of the body will be much more perfect. It's our, our deadness, insensitiveness, our lack of real spiritual aliveness that results in more suffering than need be, and more loss than need be. Oh, that we should, not mechanically and not by information, but on the principle of the body, be moved into a universal sympathy and cooperation with the people of God. It's mechanical, so often we have to read letters and give information and tell a lot in order to get some measure of prayer. But I believe, dear friends, that altogether apart from those means, if we were really in the spirit, the spirit would lay burdens on our hearts for people. And do you not think that that's a matter that we ought continually to bring to the Lord? Lord, there's someone praying today for something is it possible that I might be the answer to their prayer? If so, show me, lead me, lay it on me. That spiritual related aliveness, oh, it's a great vocation. The oneness of the body is much more to that. I must leave it and go on to number six. Peter again, a royal priesthood. A royal priesthood. This is the church. You know this is a combination of two ideas. King and priest. Kingdom and priest. Two functions brought together. The throne and the altar. What does it mean? Well, in the very briefest word, it surely means this. That it is by yielding, letting go, releasing, self-emptying, offering that divine.
divine power is exercised in this universe that the throne operates. It is suffering and glory. It is weakness and power. Seeming contradiction, Mr. Jones, but here it is in the word, a lamb in the midst of the throne. Symbol of utmost yieldness, yieldedness, and in the right sense of non-resistance. Even to evil. Even to evil. Understand what I mean? I'm not speaking of non-resistance to sin. The wrong done to you. And righteousness. A lamb to the slaughter. And through the slaughter to the throne. These are spiritual principles, you see. Spiritual principles, they are tremendous. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. This is the king speaking. This is he into whose hands has been committed all authority in heaven and in earth. See how he got it. How he got there. The church is supposed to be like that. Supposed to be like that. A royal priesthood. Priest having to do with sacrifice and suffering. King having to do with ruling, reigning. See the idea? Church. That's the conception of the church. Number seven. One new man. Ephesians 2, 14 to 16, Galatians 3, 28. The church is called the one new man. Jesus called himself, and it was his favorite title for himself, the son of man. One new man. Of course, the one left referred to there in Ephesians is the result of uh, different kinds of people having disappeared. Not you, Gentile. They have disappeared. They've gone out as two different kinds, as representatives of two orders, two racial orders of men gone out and in their place made one new man. But all I'm going to say again in that connection is taking up all that we said at the beginning about the meaning of the incarnation. The church is a different kind of entity, of manhood, of race, of mankind. A different kind, just as Christ was different, of a different order. The difference was in what? Within what? Looking on him from the outside, people did not see, discern the great difference. There may have been features that were different from other men, but that was not the thing that impressed them. They could not see the difference between him and other men. Is not this the carpet. They talked about him as they would about other men looking on him from the outside. And let us today, this, for many years I have uh, been helped by reading a witness and a testimony, but since I attended your meeting at Livingston Hall, I've lost all interest in it. Because I don't agree with what you said when you said that every Christian is a supernatural person. You see, the point has been missed. Altogether missed. Outwardly, no different perhaps from other people, although there ought to be some traces outwardly. Yet, the real secret, the real meaning is inward, isn't it? He was different. As a man, the man, 
inside the body was a different man. Governed by different laws altogether from those by which other people were governed. Governed by different conceptions. Governed from a different realm. And in that sense, always a mystery. As John said so many years afterward in writing his letter, Little children, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. It knew him not. It knoweth us not. Another kind of being. And that ought to be, finally put it this way, quite natural. Not self-conscious, of course. Not self-conscious. Not always trying to be another kind. No pose, just the best, of which we ourselves are the most unconscious, and yet, and yet, the something that does not belong to this creation. Something there that speaks of another world, of another order, another life, another nature. We just do not behave under given circumstances as others would be. God help us again. But the church is supposed to be like that. It is composed of the individuals that the church is supposed to be like that. A one new man. Number seven. The bride, the lamb, the wife. Here we need quite a lot of scriptures from Genesis, from Matthew and Mark, from Ephesians, from Revelation. Last word by the angel to the apostle, come hither, I will show thee the lamb wife. The bride of the lamb, synonymous term, and yet not actually identical in sense. We dare not stay with the details, but first of all, remember something of the beginning of that relationship. First, the first word about this relationship was from God himself. It is not good for man to be alone. So, the idea of this relationship at the very beginning was one of fellowship and companionship. Sublime idea, the relationship between Christ and his church. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Oh, mystery of mysteries, I think. Companionship, fellowship. Looked upon his son, so to speak, and said, It is not good for him to be alone. The church is supposed to be in that relationship to Christ, his companion, to fellowship with him, to have interchange of mind, of heart to move together. And then God said, I will make him a help meet. I will make him someone suitable to help him, meet to help him. Meet to help him, a help meet. Very simple idea, but transfer that to the church to minister to Christ, to take account of Christ's needs and Christ's desire and to have the whole point in his direction. How can I anticipate him, his desires and his needs? How can I best serve his interests? That, of course, is the Bible idea of a wife, you know. But the 
Bible makes the earthly relationship to be at least intended as a reflection of the heavenly, even as Christ and the church. But here our point is this, that you and I, if we are of the church, are to have our poise entirely toward him. How can we best serve him? How can we be well pleasing unto him? How can we anticipate him in his needs and desires? And what will be to his interest? That's the very first idea bound up with the bride, the lamb, wife. Of course, going alongside of that or with it is the idea of identity. They twain shall be one flesh. They are one. Not two now, but one. One flesh. Remember Ephesians 25 on that matter. Leave it. We pursue it. Be fruitful and multiply. The idea of the relationship is his increase. His increase. He shall see his feet. He shall see of the travail of his soul. See his feet. How? Well, there's no other way but by the church. So that, not you. The travail of his soul is to be satisfied by the church's bringing into being new things. There's another idea upon evangelism, doesn't it? It's for him. Not just the interest of getting souls saved. It's that he shall be his feet. The travail of his soul shall be satisfied. He shall see his feet. Church is the vessel in which and through which Christ.